So these women come to the tomb, certain all hope is lost. And there, it says, sits a man who tells them, do not be alarmed, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified, he has risen. And these words come down to us across the centuries, the same good news. Jesus has risen. Some of you might be familiar with an ancient uh, call and response. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. And this is a day to rejoice. This is a day we celebrate the greatest day in history. And I encourage us all this morning to lean in to worship this Easter morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome if you are a special welcome. If you are a visitor, a guest, we hope that uh, you will find this uh, morning of celebrating the best news ever. And to those of you online, we wish you as well a happy Easter. Join in to the celebration this morning. Christ is risen.
call for worship this morning is on the screen, and I'd ask you to please stand with me as we read together. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Please open your hymn books, if you would, to 367, as we rejoice by singing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Welcome you again to this, really, without exaggeration, this is the best day of the year. We celebrate this morning that which changes everything, that Christ has risen from the dead. Again, a special welcome if you are visiting with us this morning. We invite you to stop at the information desk on your way out. We have a small gift for you there, but even more important, make yourself known to, um, to one of the pastors that we might get to know you. We take a moment to look at our announcements, and um, they pale in comparison to the announcement of that angel on Easter morning, but these are the announcements of our church, and we live in them in the light of the resurrection, all that we do. You'll find in your bulletin um, lots of information, but some reminders. We have ministries for all ages and various groups meeting a host of different needs and support. Uh, among them, our kids, Discovery Town is our children's uh, ministry on Sunday mornings. That is from 10 to noon every Sunday morning, kids kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, ladies, the Tuesday Bible studies, uh, 10 a.m. Bible studies will resume this week on Tuesday, so take note of that. And um, 
take a special time to, to look through the many things that you'll find here in your bulletin this morning. We, um, we are a, an active uh, church, and it is our hope that we will all learn to daily, weekly, monthly, yearly grow into the reality of our new life in Christ. I think this morning couldn't be a better morning for what we have the privilege now to witness. We are going to have some baptisms, three individuals right here on Easter morning. And I want to direct our attention to the video first and then the baptisms, which so beautifully depict our new life in Christ because Christ himself has risen from the dead. goodness, what a very special morning to be able to celebrate with those who are following Jesus in baptism. And you know, I, I don't know of anything that pictures the resurrection more than believers following the Lord in this way. And, and of course, the symbolism is, is powerful, right? Just as Christ went into the tomb, um, we have three this service and eight more in the second service. They will go into the water and they will rise again in new life. Um, just as Christ did. So we have three candidates this morning for baptism. Uh, first is Beth uh, Wagner. So Beth, I'm gonna ask you to come join me. And uh, just a note, it is a little cooler. I was warned that it is, it is just a little chilly. Um, sometimes, the last time we had a baptism, I said, oh, this is really quite hot. I thought maybe they were trying to boil me out of here. Um, so e either way, boiling or cold, we, we won't belabor this. We will move along. <laughs> come on over. Come join me just a bit. So, so Beth, it's been good to get to know you and have you here at Hillcrest and see you, you know, just following the Lord. And, and, and I know you're a quiet person in many ways, but wow, I just was glad to see how the Lord, hear, hear how the Lord has worked in your life and, and really to bring you to a point today of wanting to be identified with him in baptism. This is really special. Do you have anything in particular that you wanted to share or not today? Um, not today, just thank you. And I'm happy to be here, happy to be doing this. Yeah, I mean, I said, I've said to everybody, there isn't any better day. I mean, not that there's a bad day to be baptized, but Easter Sunday is, is a special, special morning. So maybe come this way just a bit. I don't know, you're gonna just hold on by her with both hands. So just give me just a second here. So Beth Wagner, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your repentance from sin and in obedience to his command, I now baptize you into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we go. This is a new life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So I'm going to ask 
Jim to join me. Jim Wahlberg, his wife, have been attending. I think we decided, I think I'm gonna come on this side too. Um, it's, it's a little cool, right? Yeah. It's, it's not a hot tub. <laughs> And nobody could say that. Um, I'm not even sure it's a warm pool. But, uh, <laughs> so I think we decided Memorial Day last year, we had a conversation and shortly thereafter you folks started attending. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So it's been great to get to know you and your wife and, and uh, hear you know, your faith journey and your desire to join the church. And I know you were baptized as, as a baby, as I was. but. Uh, just recognizing, you know, as a believer, I want to identify with the Lord today in baptism. And, wow, really special, really special opportunity, and I'm honored to be able to baptize you today. Thank so, you. yeah. So, go ahead and just take my arm. So, Jim Wahlberg, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your repentance from sin, and in obedience to his command, I now baptize you into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, see, right? Am I right? There's a little chilly, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not baptizing Pastor Ben, but I need to tell you, I need to tell you something. There's been a little bit of an inside jab that's been going on that I, I had one, not you, but one of the other pastors said to me, after one of our recent baptisms, why is it that you always get to do all the baptisms? <laughs> I said, well, I said, let me in on the fun, <laughs> That's know? right. So, um, so I said, well, we can change that up. And, and actually, this time, we actually have several students and, mm -hmm. and youth. So um, it's your turn. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah. All right, so Sophia, I'll invite you to come on in. All right, Sophie, so how old are you, 10? 10. 10, very good. This is very exciting, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to be able to baptize you today and it's been cool to get to know you a little bit and your sister and your your parents and your family and um, I've shared with lots of other students just in preparation for today it's really it's really encouraging to see our young people and our students taking this step and following the Lord and baptism it's it's an awesome step in your faith so I, I don't know if you wanted to did you want to share it all about why you want to be baptized or? Um, no, not really. no that's all right we can just get to it yeah okay so I want to move over this way a little bit, so you can just hold my arm. Yeah. And then um, after I pray and say amen, I'll give you back and put it up, okay? All right, are you ready? Okay. Sophie Jordan, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your, your repentance from sin and in obedience to his command, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Open your hymn books, if you would please, to hymn number 368. And then stand with me once again as we sing, He Lives. Thank you. 
may be seated. We direct our attention now to these words of good news from John's Gospel. I'm going to be reading from chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. If you reach in front of you, uh, below the chair in front of you, and find a Bible, you'll find this passage starting on 768. John chapter 20, starting with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked, at the, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Bow with me as we pray. Father, this is a day of days, the day that we celebrate that upon which all our hope and life is set, that our Savior, born in a cradle, killed on a cross, has now risen from the dead. That death no longer has victory, that we who belong to him who is victorious over death are ourselves given new and eternal life in him. God, this is a day to celebrate. And I pray that you would awaken our hearts to the truth, God. Not just of the beauty of the flowers and the gathering of family and a meal enjoyed together, God. All of that, yes, but much more we serve a risen Savior and that that has changed everything. So awaken us, God. Open our eyes this morning that we might see the glory of our risen Christ afresh or maybe for some for the very first time. This morning, God, we pray that the power of the new life in Christ and the working of your Holy Spirit would attend to those for whom this day still bears the burdens of a Good Friday or of a, a long Saturday, God, 
May the good news of Jesus Christ break in. And may you, God, break in to bring healing and hope where those are needed. To bring mercy and forgiveness. To bring, God, all that accompanies your great victory. And so for those among us, God, whom we know that are ill this morning, who are home and would love to be here but cannot, for those who grieve this day, may the good news of Easter minister deeply to their hearts. God, we are privileged this morning to have witnessed the baptisms of Beth and Jim and Sophie. And God, together we all pray that you would pour out abundant blessing on each of them. May this day mark a new season of refreshment in the Lord for each of them. May they grow from strength to strength and grace to grace. And God, indeed, for all of us who are in Christ, may we never be settled and satisfied with where we are today, but always yearning more for you. Grow into the, the grace and the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we hear your word this morning, God, we pray that you would open our ears, open our eyes, that we might see him who has risen from the dead and who will return, who says, I make all things new. Lift us up this morning, we pray, and may the glory be yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a quick question for you. How many of you frequently find your personal items in places you least expect to find them? I mean, just to ask, I mean, I'm talking about your car keys, like your phone or your purse, your wallet. Anybody find your keys? In, I mean, just what are they doing there? How'd they get there? And I, and I get that. That's uh, personal testimony time, testimony time here. Um, that's why the smartest thing I, I ever did was marry my wife 30 some years ago. Uh, because she's an organizational guru, and she rarely loses anything. So to help me out, she invents ways to help me keep track of all of my stuff. In fact, I want to show you a picture. This is the place of late. Now, we've just moved, okay, and so we're in a little studio apartment now. And Danielle says, this is the place you put your keys and your wallet and your special pen and all the stuff that you need to get out the door in the morning. And I'm happy to report that 87.3% of the time, <laughs> It's, it's right there. It's right there. However, 12.7% of the time, I still can't find my keys, and I can't find my wallet, and my favorite pen, and my glasses, and all the stuff. And, and who put them in the closet? And who left them in the bathroom? And, and, and out in the grill? I mean, give me a break. Who does that? Who would put them there? True story. A couple weeks ago, we're moving, okay? And um, it was a little crazy. So I am at the, at the old house, and I'm looking around frantically for my glasses. And I, I mean, I'm from the, uh, we have a finished, had a finished attic, I mean, to the base. I'm looking everywhere for my glasses. Guess where they were? <laughs> well, that's what we want to talk about this morning, but not car keys, not wallets, purses, or glasses. Uh, today I've titled the message, Finding Jesus where you least expect him. So let's all get a Bible open to John 20. If you close your Bible, open it up again. Great to have you folks online with us. There's an outline in your bulletin. And as Pastor Steve said, you can download today's bulletin from our website, uh, those of you who are online. Now, when we think of where we expect to find Jesus, right, we may think of places like this on an Easter Sunday morning, right? 
expect to find Jesus there. Or we might expect to find Jesus, you know, when, when the sun comes up, right, and the rays of light stream across the hillside, across the lake, right? We expect to find Jesus there. Or, or we might expect to find Jesus when, you know, we're celebrating a big event, like a, like a baptism or, or uh, a wedding, a birth of a child, some major, uh, you know, advancement in our career, or when somebody that's been incredibly sick suddenly gets well. We expect to find Jesus and sense his presence there. But what we're going to see this morning is that we can also find Jesus on mornings when the sun doesn't appear to be shining and when someone we love has died and when our health seems to get be going from bad to worse. And so even on those days we can find Jesus. In fact, we will find him oftentimes it seems, in the places we least expect to find him. And that's a really good thing. That's a really good thing because how many of you would agree with me that life is full of all kinds of unexpected things? Yeah, exactly. Life is a journey on lots of twists, lots of turns. And so we can be driving along, right? We're making time, we're smooth sailing, and all of a sudden, bam, out jumps a deer. How many of you have ever had that happen, by the way? Yeah, I, I have too. What in the world? Where did that thing come from? Or we're, we think we're on the fast track to success, right? Our career seems to be taking off. All's going well until it's not. And there's a layoff. There's a, there's a transfer. There's a firing. And we find ourselves, it seems like we're on the outside looking in. Or we're, we're feeling incredibly strong. Actually, we feel great. We're sleeping well. We're eating well. You know, taking our vitamins, exercising, all that sort of stuff. We go to the doctor, and the doctor says, actually... There's a really big problem that you need to pay attention to. Life is full of all kinds of unexpected things. So as we come to John chapter 20, continuing on our journey through the Gospel of John, we've been on now just about four months, Jesus and his disciples have just been dealt a, I mean, a devastating, life-altering, unexpected blow because they were not expecting Jesus to die. Jesus said that... Uh, he, he, he warned them that, that, that this would be coming. He had told them many times, as we've been reading Gospel of John, the other Gospel writes, writers conclude, uh, uh, also record this. That, and if you remember back in John chapter 10, we spent a couple of weeks here. He said that I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd will what? He will lay down his life for his friends. He, and he, he said, no one takes it from me. I willingly lay it down of my own accord, and I have the authority to pick it back up again, speaking of his resurrection. John chapter 12, we, we pointed out the, uh, the, the, the parable that Jesus tells of a grain of wheat falling to the ground and, and symbolizing his death, right, and in order for the salvation of many to occur. Later in the same chapter, Jesus makes the statement, and when I am lifted up, right, from the earth, I will draw all people to myself, indicating how he would die, but also that he would rise again. Now, but, but none of the disciples connected the dots. None of the disciples saw this coming. None of his followers were expecting Jesus to die. They were expecting him to usher in a new kind of kingdom, you know, to throw the Romans out, to throw the, the pagans and the, the Gentiles out, and there would finally once again be peace in their promised land. And that's, you know, a Messiah to do something of, of the centuries of messianic prophecies, you know, something worthy of that. That's what they were expecting. But Jesus did die. He died a horrendous, horrifying, humiliating death on a cross. And now it's, he's been buried for days. And so we, can we also say Jesus, were not, uh, Jesus followers were not expecting a resurrection on that Easter Sunday morning. Not at all. If there was any fleeting thought of a resurrection, that was long dead and buried with Jesus in that tomb, sealed with a massive tomb, a stone weighing tons. There was no expectation of a resurrection on that Easter morning. But then, here we go, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 1, tells us, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, it's interesting that John zeroes in on Mary Magdalene, He's writing about you know, at least 50 years after these events have taken place. And he chooses to focus in on Mary. Well, we know from the other gospel accounts, there was a group of women that went, at least four, maybe more, likely more. And they went to the tomb before dawn. Now, why are they going to the tomb? <laughs> My guess is they can't sleep. 
And so they all get together and they go together. But again, John focuses on Mary Magdalene, Mary from Magdala, about 50 miles north of Jerusalem, up in the Galilee region. I've been there, some of you have as well. It's a, fa it's a fantastic, wonderful place to visit. Jewish Talmud says that Magdala was known for prostitution. And we know from Dr. Luke's uh, gospel account that Jesus had cast out of Mary Magd of Magdala seven demons. So she had a terrible, she had, she had a sinful past that possibly involved prostitution before Jesus delivered her. That's her past. And we know that Jesus said, those who have been forgiven much, what? Love much. And it's clear that Mary loves Jesus. So she's going to the tomb, and she's going there to anoint Jesus' body with spices, with perfumes, a common practice in Jewish burial traditions at the time. And they did this out of respect. They did this out of love. They did this to honor the deceased person. And, and it had a practical <laughs> um, effect as well because it, it, it sought to counteract the smell of the decomposition that was well underway at that time, by that time. So Jesus died late on Friday, and the Sabbath was about to begin with sundown. And there wasn't time to do all of this. So now with the Sabbath over, the ladies returned to the tomb to finish what had been started. So again, look at the text. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, do you hear a sense of a panic in that? I do. I do. You see, Mary, I mean, she was stunned. She was floored to find that tomb open. Now, how exactly these women hope to get in the tomb and remove, you know, move that massive stone out of the way, uh, that, that's a whole, another whole question. You know, love doesn't always make sense. Uh, but they get to the tomb, and the, the stone is already moved back. The tomb is already open. So Mary takes off, and she runs to the two of the chief apostles, to, to Peter and to John, and it's obvious that Mary is assuming that Jesus' body has been stolen. Her knee-jerk reaction, in other words, is that, oh, good news, Jesus has been raised from the dead. No. Her knee-jerk reaction is, oh, no, they've stolen Jesus' body. I was reminded this week of another almost body theft that occurred 148 years ago, um, next month, April 1876, President Abraham Lincoln's body was in an unguarded tomb a couple miles outside of Springfield, Illinois. You, you remember, some of you know this story? Um, I remembered it, and I, I had to read up on it again. So there were two Chicago counterfeiters that were part of a, a, a gang in Chicago. You, you know this story? I, I had to refresh my memory on, on the facts. But anyway, they were part of this gang, and they hatched this plot to to, base, to steal Abraham Lincoln's body from the tomb and hold it hostage as ransom so that one of their gangster members, you know, that was in prison would be released and $200,000 cash. Yeah, no joke. That'd be, that'd be a lot of money in that day. It's a lot of money today. So, well, the, the Secret Service had, had an informant and the, the whole plot didn't come to anything. It was, it was foiled. And so, in 1901... After being moved 17 times since the day he was shot and killed, Abraham Lincoln's simple red cedar casket was finally lowered into a large steel cage that was then attached to it a huge underground boulder, and then 4,000 pounds of concrete poured on top of it to make sure no one would ever steal his body again or attempt to do so. So, right, so, so nobody ever, uh, did not steal Lincoln's body, and contrary to what Mary Magdalene thought, no one had stolen Jesus' body either. But, but that's what she went and told Peter and John. They, they've stolen the Lord's body. Verse 3, so, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and that's John, and John was younger, it makes sense, he would have, Gotten there first before the old guy, you know. Verse 5, and he bent over and he looked into the, 
looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. That's John. I got to tell you, when you go to Israel, one of the places you just have to visit is, is the garden tomb. Some of you have been there. Um, is John with us, sister? John Delancey is he here. Yes, you're here, John. So Dr. John took, just took a tour to Israel. And you went to the garden tomb, right? Yeah, I saw, I saw some of your pictures followed you. Uh, so secluded place outside the Damascus Gate. Uh, and, and it's really cool because it's kind of uh, under the shadows of this, this hill that's shaped like a skull. It looks, used to look um, more like that in years gone by. But nobody's sure if this is the tomb for sure where Jesus' body was buried. But it fits the picture. It fits the picture. And the Apostle John says that he bent over and looked into the tomb. And that's what you'd have to do uh, at the garden tomb to, to look in. Verse 6. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, <laughs> he's struggling to catch up, right? Who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself separate from the linen Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. So I want you to try and picture what the disciples are seeing at this moment as they enter the tomb. And we need to understand how the Jews buried their dead in order to get the picture here. They, they used strips of linen um, and, a, and a gooey substance that was a mixture of aloe and, and spices. And the Bible, Bible tells us that they had over 100 pounds of spices to bury Jesus. So what they would do is they would wrap each limb, you know, each arm, each leg, and, and they would alternate, you know, the substance, gooey substance uh, on it, and, and just, just kind of build a cocoon. And that's what would happen as that would dry. It would form a hardened cocoon around the body. And they did it, you know, from the legs all the way up to, to the neck. And then at the, the head, they would take another burial cloth and wrap the head separately. Now, what's fascinating here is, is in the Greek, it's, it's very clear. These linens are, are literally lying in place. Their, their folds are undisturbed. It's not, in other words, like, you know, uh, Jesus woke up and, and he started tearing everything off and it's just strewn about the tomb. The linens are lying in place like, the body isn't there inside anymore, so it's just sort of collapsed on itself. Are you getting the picture? Now, the wrapping around the head is set to the side. Now, this is important because some people think that Jesus really didn't die. He was, he was you know, unconscious, and so he got in the coolness of the tomb. This is the swoon theory. And, uh, and he woke up, and he, he tore his stuff off, you know, and busted loose, and somehow moved that massive stone out of the way and got out of the tomb. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive with what the eyewitnesses saw. But can you imagine how confused, how confounded, how completely and utterly mystified these disciples would be, would be looking at what they're seeing and trying to imagine what is going on here? Now watch this, verse 8, again. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, also went inside he saw and believed. Now the question that I've been asking this week, and really leaning to, is, is what did he believe? Now if you have the New Living Translation, I, I think they've, I, my humble opinion is they've gotten this wrong. They've kind of forced the conclusion that, G, that at this moment, John believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. But it, it doesn't actually, they, they force the next verse to that conclusion. Because the next verse reads, verse 9, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. That, that suggests that John did not believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. At least not yet. And so the question is, well, what did he believe? And I believe what he believed at that moment was that Mary was right. Someone somehow has stolen the Lord's body. And that makes sense because verse 10 says, then disciples went back to their homes. What else is there to do? But Mary continued outside the tomb crying. And what else is she to do? 
My point is, the disciples also believed. They had no reason to believe otherwise. They believed that Jesus' body had been stolen. Again, because there was no expectation that Jesus would rise again from the dead. The, the disciples, the, his followers, were not expecting a resurrection. So they go home. And Mary stays. She grieves. This, the, this is the heartache of it all. Then look at the end of verse 10. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away. See, she still believes it. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she still did not realize that it was Jesus. And if you're taking notes, note that. Jesus revealed, feels himself often in unexpected ways. And again, not to, to belabor the point, but Mary is, is absolutely grief-stricken, right? She's, she is just still in utter shock, and there's, there's no expectation other than Jesus is dead. And now someone, somehow, some way, has stolen his body out of this tomb. So even when she sees him, she can't believe her eyes. She doesn't recognize him. It doesn't dawn on her what she is seeing. Verse 15. Woman, he said, this is Jesus speaking. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you put him? And I will go get him. Now, don't miss this. Verse 16. And Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. When did the lights go on? When, when did her brain connect with what her eyes were seeing? At the moment Jesus said her name. That's when she realized what she was seeing. Mary recognized Jesus. Just one word. And not in Greek, not in Hebrew, but the native Aramaic he says, Mary. She instantly recognizes that voice, right? It's just like, you know, uh, before the days of caller ID, okay, those of us would have picked up the phone and recognized a voice of someone we loved. They don't even have to tell us who they are. We recognize the voice. So they say our name. And John says, she turned around and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And you read on through the rest of the chapter. This is how it happens with the rest of the disciples. That later that day, with a couple that are headed to Emmaus, just a bit out of sight of Jerusalem, walking along the road, Jesus appears, speaks to them. And later that, that, that night, uh, all of them except Thomas, Jesus appears, speaks to them. And over the next several weeks, over a period of 40 days, Jesus would appear to over 500 they would believe because they saw and they heard his voice. That's the big news we celebrate today. And, and it also brings us to a really big question. And I say it's a question we ought to ask every time we open this book. And so take a deep breath and let's lift it up with some resurrection enthusiasm. All right. Let me hear it on three. One, two, three. So what? Wow. You did not disappoint. Way to go. <laughs> nice. Didn't they do good? So, you know, you think, okay, it's that Pastor Mark, thanks for the, you know, the resurrection uh, event reminder and a little history lesson on Abraham Lincoln from 148 years ago. Glad those robbers didn't uh, take his body dead. Glad Jesus' body wasn't um, stolen either, but, but so what? What's this have to do with us today? What difference does this make in our lives today? Here's what we need to understand on this resurrection morning. Jesus' resurrection has unexpected blessings. 
And when I use the word blessings, that's a, that's a hyper-churchy word, right? I'm talking about things you would not get any other way than through Jesus' resurrection. These are supernatural benefits that come to you only because Jesus has risen from the dead. Let me give you three of them very quickly. First, because Jesus lives, I can live forever. Say that with me. Because Jesus lives, I can live forever. I don't believe you. Say it again. Because Jesus lives, I can live forever. That's what Jesus promised for all who would believe and trust in him. John chapter 14, verse 12. Because I live, you too will live. Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, he's talking about Adam there, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The promise of eternal life alters the calculus of life and how we live it. Is that not true? Amen. It changes everything. Because this life isn't all there is. Our last day is not our last day. No. If we know and trust in Jesus, in Jesus as our Savior, death is merely a doorway into the fullness of the life Jesus has promised us for all eternity. Because Jesus lives, I can live forever. That's number one. That's the first blessing of Easter. And the second is... Jesus knows my name. Do you know that? Just, just as he knew Mary Magdalene's name, just as he knew his disciples' names and his followers' names, he knows your name. He knows my name. See, we aren't just somebody. We aren't just anybody of the billions of people on the planet. No. The risen Christ knows your name. He knows your name. He knows my name. And this leads us to third, and I believe perhaps the most unexpected blessing of Jesus' resurrection, and that is number three, Jesus is with me even in the unexpected events of life. I want you to look at verses 17 and 18 with me. Jesus says something to Mary that confuses a lot of people. Verse 17, Jesus said, do not hold on to me. Speaking to Mary, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and to your Father, my, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Do you understand that Jesus is preparing Mary for something wonderful? Something awesome, something unexpected that would occur just 50 days from then when the Holy Spirit would come not to be with her, but to live in her forever. The same would be true for his, his disciples. Jesus was living, leaving. He would soon return to heaven, but he had told his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. No, I will send the Holy Spirit to live in you. And the same is true for all who come to believe. That includes you. That includes me. Jesus isn't here physically today. But if you know him by faith, he lives in you. He is with you in all the unexpected events of life. This week I read of Annie Lobart, who was trafficked and pimped as a prostitute for over 10 years in Las Vegas. And after overdosing on cocaine, lying in a hospital bed, she put her faith in Jesus Christ. And today she doesn't look back. Instead, she leads a ministry known as Hookers for Christ, which seeks to rescue women out of trafficking. I also thought of Tyrone Flowers, who was 17 and likely headed for the NBA. Until in a confrontation with one of his teammates, turned violent, and he was shot and paralyzed for life. Tyrone Flowers came to faith in Jesus, and today he leads Higher Impact, it's called, a ministry to rescue and mentor at-risk at, at youth in Christ-centered ways in St. Louis, Missouri. And, of course, I thought of Mary Magdalene. 
with a sordid, perhaps satanic uh, past involving prostitution possibly, whose life was rescued by Jesus. And she became the first person at the resurrection to see him. And 2,000 years later and counting, right, every place this story is being celebrated today, her story is told. He knew her name. And he knows your name. And he knows every situation that you're going with. Because the truth is, some of us know the sting of death that Mary experienced because it's all too fresh. Some of us know other kinds of pain, physical pain. This morning, disorienting pain some of us are dealing with. Some of us have emotional pain that it's even difficult for us to put into words. Or relational pain that we long to be healed. Do you know that Jesus is with you? He knows your name. You're not alone. That's the hope of the resurrection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you <laughs> for sending your one and only Son, again, not to condemn the world, but through, through your Son, through his death and through his resurrection, we might be rescued, we might be saved, we might be redeemed, that our lives might be changed and we would be given a whole new hope for eternity. But not just for eternity, not just for after this life, but in the here and now. Lord, I pray for each person today, each one of us that finds ourselves in pain or sensing that we are having to deal with whatever we're dealing with all alone. I pray that you move each one of us by your spirit to a deep faith in Jesus, to trust in him. And this morning, if you've never come to a place of personal faith in Jesus, you can do that just as countless numbers of people have over the past centuries. Reach out to him by faith and see, say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for me. Come, be my savior. Be with me, Lord. I need you. I need you. And know this, that the Lord hears you and he loves to answer that prayer. You are not alone. He knows your name. He loves you. So thank you for this truth, Lord. Thank you for this encouragement. Thank you for this day to celebrate, to rejoice in your presence. Receive our worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
friends, Christ has risen from the dead. And this is the news that changes everything. This is a day to rejoice. This is a day to enjoy the good news that death has been defeated by our Lord. So go now with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. All God's people said, amen. amen. Go in peace.